so um, so so should, should we start shall yeah, i yeah i think harish harish will harish will introduce oh, you then okay we'll actually yeah. okay 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 good yeah. all right uh, thank you professor panigrahi uh, good afternoon everyone myself harish rao welcome you all in the post lunch session by dr gopalakrishnan balasubramanian dr balasubramanian is an experienced researcher having 17 plus year of experience after his phd in 2005 from iisc bangalore He has worked as a researcher in couple of renowned institutes. Then he headed Nano Scale Spin Imaging Group at Max Planck Institute for Biological Biophysical Chemistry during 2011 to 2019. After that, from 2019 to 21, he worked as a principal investigator at Labney's Institute of Surface Engineering. He also co-founded uh, the company called Exceed Q that is based in Leipzig, Leipzig Germany. and exceed q develop a develop and sell quantum processors that are room temperature operable that are energy efficient and green and also an affordable devices currently uh, dr balasubramanian is chief executive officer of the company exceed q and now he will share the research activities being carried out at exceed q over to you dr balasubramanian thank you thank you very very, very much dr sahu uh, so uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, give a lecture so before i begin the lecture uh, i had to apologize for uh, the last minute uh, shift uh, uh, because it was supposed to be given by dr shri arumugam who is our uh, head of the ipr uh, intellectual property management and she had a very uh, important meeting for the company uh, uh, regarding the pct so uh, she has to be uh, with another uh, delegation so no, this is why i'm 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 the yeah, last one actually yeah. so i mean, so, uh, yeah, I, mean you know, i think the, one of yeah, one of the role of the ceo is basically i should be willing to do basically any job you know this is why <laughs> i was able to jump in last moment uh thank you very much so without further ado i'll just uh, start my presentation so i will go ahead and share my my screen uh, uh are are you able to see my screen yes a white screen perhaps right yeah right now it is white <laughs> yes okay how about now ah now it's okay perfect all right so uh, well actually dr sahu uh, expl- uh, you know gave an introduction but uh, it's also maybe i can fill in a little bit uh, so uh, i'm originally from madurai in tamil nadu so i did my bachelor's and masters uh, from a uh, from an institution called the american college madurai uh, which is uh, you know one of the oldest uh, institutions in india and after finishing my masters i went on to do a phd at the indian institute of science bangalore uh, in the physics department where i investigated uh, uh, nano structures of carbon um, more precisely how to dope amorphous carbon by nitrogen in order to bring in metal insulator transitions so it was mostly a, 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 a transport property study and then i went on to uh, went for a postdoc uh, with the group of professor yark wachtrop uh, who is a pioneer in this uh, uh, in this quantum um, uh, field with nv centers and uh, the group of fedor elasco um, there i stayed for about 4 years and did a lot of uh, fantastic work uh, for example um, you know these these couple of works on quantum sensing which uh, in 2008 i published uh, in, in in nature and in nature material so these two papers uh, Uh, the first one showed how a single nitrogen vacancy defect can be used as a as a magnetometer not just a static magnetometer but a scanning magnetometer in the nano scale um, and this is basically i could say the starting of this uh, field to use this as a quantum sensor um, and then uh, went ahead and showed that we could also use this nv centers in a special type of diamond which is called isotopically enriched diamond and get very high uh, coherence times um and uh, these two papers are still uh, the top cited in this field and then um, as i as, as dr sagu mentioned that i went to uh, max planck institute in uh, biophysical chemistry in gottingen uh, to found my research group uh, where i concentrated mostly on quantum sensing so um i published quite a, well, quite some papers and uh, um uh yeah and and well basically there uh, in addition to using this as a sensor i was also involved how we can actually use this quantum um uh, this qubits as a as a robust uh, uh, 
um, you know, qubits or robust uh, sensor. So um, these are a couple of publications came from that. And then, um, as, as mentioned, that in 2021, I decided to co found a company, and uh, we are here now. So these are my research portfolio uh, where I had worked uh, on, on, on these NB centers. Map. Right, let's go to the main part of the talk. Um, uh, first, I want to quote uh, basically this article in 1942 by uh, Professor C.V. Raman uh, on the physics of time. Uh, it's a current science article. Um, so he starts by saying that by reasons of its remarkable properties, diamond is a substance of extraordinary interest to the physicist interested in the study of solids. It exhibits in a characteristically striking fashion many phenomena which are scarcely noticeable with other solids in ordinary circumstance. And then he goes on and explains that how uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the remarkable paper on 1907 by Einstein was, uh, was actually using the data which was collected from diamond. And then he says, history has a way of repeating itself. I mean, he talks in 1942 saying history has a way of repeating itself and the study of diamond should therefore appeal strongly to the experimenter seeking new avenues of research and to the theorist seeking new and fruitful lines of physical, uh, the physical thought concerning the solid state. So he says for that reason, he has been studying from 1930 and this is actually even true today. You know, the diamond, the same material, what has been uh, an, a, an object of interest for almost 100 or more than 100 years is now coming to the limelight. Now with one little small flavor is a quantum material. So today we are talking about quantum applications of NB defects in diamond, uh, where the nitrogen vacancy spins in diamond are promising nano sensor for precision measurement of magnetic electric field, spins, charge, temperature, pressure, and the ambient condition just by using lights on microwave. Right, so um, with this one, um, this is going to be the title uh, or outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about diamond quantum technology, the principal quantum sensors, quantum computers, and uh, um, lastly about our company. All right, this NB defects in diamond. Right, so what is this NB defect? So N is for nitrogen, V is for vacancy. So when you take a diamond lattice, it's made up of carbon atoms bounded by the sp3 hybridization. So tetragonally, all the carbons are bounded to each other carbon. But now if one of the carbon is replaced by a nitrogen and the next lattice size is supposed to be a you know, missing carbon atom or a vacancy, as you see here, this constitute a nitrogen vacancy defect. So what exactly happens is in this vacancy site, an extra pair of electron is trapped because you know it's like a like a void and the electron is trapped and as we know the diamond is insulator so the electrons are trapped here and this trapped electron um, is the quantum state or the quantum system what we will be probing so think of this nv center as an electron trapped in a perfectly insulating diamond matrix that's how one has to see it this single electron in this presence of this neighboring atoms form itself it's like a, it's a, like another molecule so um, this is a this is an atomic emitter, meaning this has some fluorescence. We shine green light, it emits red light. And like 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 any molecule, like like rhodamine or, 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 or other things. Um, the electron is perfectly trapped here, right? It's an insulating material, so the electron is trapped, so it's perfectly photostable. The electrons do not escape, or in other hands, it cannot bleach. Yeah, like a conventional dye molecule. And this can be produced on demand in nano diamond or bulk diamond uh, with, with nanometer precisions. So this can be prepared in you know, long millimeter sized diamond, micro scale diamonds, and even nano scale diamonds. So these nitrogen vacancy defect can be done. Now, um, the, the, uh, the way how it's produced is we can take very pure diamond slabs of few millimeter side, and we can implant with the nitrogen atoms uh, ions and uh, then we can anneal the system so that the vacancies migrate and all the excess vacancies um, to just anneal itself and uh, the nitrogen and then the, the vacancy that adjacent positions just stays as a, a as a trapped electron system and now as i said like you shine green light it gets it gives red light and if you put this in a confocal fluorescence microscope and scan a raster scan these bright spots what you see here is actually one defect one nitrogen vacancy defect or these dots represent just one atom so this just optically seeing one atom in a solid state is the is the big plus point here 
and the electron is trapped, it doesn't escape. So um, all these bright spots is presence of basically one electron that we can you know conveniently see under room temperature and how um, you know uh, how, how good that is right you know so we could, uh, we could really robustly trap a single electron in a solid state and uh, the it doesn't move it doesn't bleach you know it's just rock solid and this is a zoom of one of these nitrogen vacancy centers as you see there like you know this is very bright and it's a diffraction limited spot size of about 300 nanometer and this is one nv center or one quantum bit right um well i mean this is more like a dye molecule yes you shine light it gives light back so what's a big deal right but the most uh, important or interesting result come from the fact that the single electron um has quantum states like up down that can be actually read out just by this optics that's the, the beauty of it now if you take a single electron we know that in single electron like you know there is xenon splitting so the levels have to split and now uh, the the um the light emitted by single uh, nv center is dependent on the spin state or when the spin state is up it gives more light than the spin state which is down so um, when we start collecting the fluorescence photons from this microscope we shine green light we collect red light and then when we apply a microwave, when the microwave induces a transition between the up and the down state, the fluorescence counts will decrease. And this is what you see here as, a, as something called optically detected magnetic resonance. And as the Zeeman effect, as we know that we apply this, uh, we, we increase the strength of the magnetic field, the, the, the levels will start splitting. And this is what you see as transition. So this is a signature that we are able to read or manipulate the state of a single electron in solid state and at room temperature. And that's the uh, beauty of this MV center system. So it's not only the, the emissive, but the, the, the spin states are encoded in the optical emission and we can actually manipulate them very conveniently with light or microwave. And it has a long coherence time. Um, so, uh, you know, basically by knowing these two uh, transitions, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, induced by microwave, we can measure the magnetic field present at the location of NV center very precisely. Uh, just by knowing these two spin resonance transitions, we, we will know, um, which means that this is uh, nothing but a magnetometer, right? So we can measure magnetic field, but now we are measuring magnetic field just with one atom and just with light. We don't need any, uh, you know, electrical contacts like a Hall effect, uh, a Hall bar, or something, because you shine light without any contact, and this can report uh, the the spin states back. And by knowing the, the the spin transition frequencies, we can find the magnetic field. So it's a magnetometer. It's a one atom optical non-contact magnetometer. Um, so. Well, what we can do with that, or one of the projects what we have been doing, uh, I was doing in Göttingen is um, the size of this NV center is very small. It's in, it's in nanoscale. I mean, it's like one atom. But then if we can take it very close to the object of interest, for example, if it's a protein molecule, right? So you take a protein molecule or a biomolecule, biomolecule is made up of hydrogen. Hydrogen has magnetic moment, which means that the hydrogen will give some stray magnetic field around the protein, this green shaded region. Now, if I take my magnetometer, you know, think of it like a compass, but it's a very, very tiny compass uh, of the size of an atom. So I can take it very close, very proximal to the, uh, uh, to the, to the, to the molecule or the object of interest, which means I can measure the magnetic field there. And taking this uh, profile, then we would be able to find the structure of a molecule um, now just with one molecule only like the so-called single molecule structure prediction. So we don't need like, you know, ensemble of molecules or so, but just having one molecule will be able to profile. So this uh, has a lot of uh, advantage in healthcare because you can try to di diagnose and, you know, uh, diseases in its early stage and, and have a better, uh, uh, you know, understanding on the structure, binding properties and so on and so forth. So still this is an area of ongoing research. Um, just to uh, tell you what, what kind of applications get them out of it. Um, and another project uh, which uh, we're still doing uh, from the academic side with some partners is um, when, when we have this very high sensitivity sensor, um, magnetic field sensor, we can actually attach it to an optical fiber and multiplex it uh, to hundreds of thousands of fibers so that we can measure the brain activity. 
So uh, this is more like uh, uh, what they have, the magnetoencephalogram, MEG, uh, which requires uh, squid sensors uh, for, for, uh, for measuring or uh, atom vapor cells. Um, here we could use solid state strength sensors uh, for measuring. This is still an ongoing project, but I'm just uh, saying that, you know, that, that the, the breadth with which this quantum sensors can be, can be useful. Um, now let's come to the quantum computers. Um, that's the main theme of uh, the, the summer school here. Um, let's talk about the origin of computers, right? So uh, the very reason the computers were invented or the, um, the initial form of this modern day computers or investor uh, inventor um, is to break uh, the German encryption uh, machine called Enigma. So during World War II, uh, the, the, uh, uh, they were using uh, this Enigma for encryption from the German side, and uh, the British and other um, um, allied nations were interested to um, uh, decode this information. So a code is encrypted, and this is like a normal typewriter as you see here. And this is the this is the machine which takes a, a, a readable text and uh, scrambles this and then send it across the wire, um, you know, wireless. And then the receiving party will have a, an, uh, a decryption key, which they will fit in, and then they would be able to read this thing. So anybody who is intercepting in the middle will not be able to read it. And now, um, well, um, one can do uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this decryption, but um, it is a very laborious task. So you have to find a combination of, of letters and words and with certain linguistic recurrences, one can, one can decode the information or find this encryption pattern. And uh, it's a laborious task, but it's a mechanical one. Like, you know, you have to find the combination, see whether it says something. And this is why um, actually, uh, you know, this, this computer was, was, was invented uh, by Turing. Uh, or this, this decryption machine was invented by Alan Turing uh, just to solve this problem, right? You know, uh, to, to crack the Enigma, Enigma code. So why I'm stressing this is it's a mechanical job. So Alan Turing, you know, being the, uh, a very smart um, uh, scientist, he decided that, oh, well, why don't I build a machine? Because the machine is not going to undergo fatigue. The machine is not going to make mistakes, but it will routinely do much, much faster than a human can do. It is not a way to bring intelligence into it, but it's a way to basically, uh, you know, make a, a, a routine job autonomous. So the first computer was designed to have an autonomy, um, but it is never intended to think or, uh, or do something new. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, any unexpected outcome, what we, will, we could or we, we, we might get from a computer should be treated as a noise because it is supposed to you know, faithfully uh, reproduce the task what we had given it. So new thing coming from that is uh, near zero. If something new comes out, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's, it's wrong, it's an error. We have to find where, where it's wrong. So uh, the computer has been done for doing a routine thing, but we have been stretching the, uh, you know, the, the, the goal or the usability of a computer several folds by, 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 by using it to do all sorts of things, right? I mean. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we had automated quite a lot of uh, things, but never the modern computer can, can even approach the intellect or the, um, or the uh, innovative creativeness uh, of, a, of, a, of a human. Now, one way scientists over the past, because one, uh, one idea or like the one advantage is you can make these chips very easily, you know, it's just like a die, you know, method like just, just, you know, it's like an industrial, I naively even call that the printing process. You make this transistors, like, you know, make the connections, everything's fine. So this is how it has been steadily increasing, but there is this so-called Mushla. Every, every two years, the transistors doubles in size. Now, um, now this means that this is like an exponential increase and this cannot sustain. Right now, um, IBM's uh, or Intel's, uh, uh, processors are having, uh, I think, three nanometers as the, as the size of the of the of the active region in a transistor. 
So three nanometers is very small. You know, as they push it to, for the next generation to 1.5 nanometer, this is like uh, you know 200 atoms. And if they even push it further, um, the classical nature is going to cease, and the quantum nature of even those silicon and the dopants and all these things are going to play a part. One thing. And the second thing is how to remove the heat from this very tiny region. And all those things are putting a very, uh, you know, a very, uh, very Herculean task to solve these problems of, of, of brute force solving the computational power by packing more number of transistors. Or another way, what I'm saying is, yes, the, com the computer was invented for some job and we tried to put so much to it to automate, which requires more transistor. We started to pack more transistors. We started to kind of push this technology, but we are nearing the limit that this is not a viable way to go, right? I mean, this, um, I had to uh, 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 quote uh, uh, Richard Feynman when he said that if you have a very complex task which involves nature, uh, you know, like, like, like biological molecule or weather prediction or something, which is a multi-parameter problem, then better use a quantum to solve because the system is quantum. So rather than trying to take a quantum problem, put it in a classical computer, and then try to make sense of it, um, maybe uh, you know this approach uh, um, should be should be should be rethought. Let's say and this is fine; it has been working so far, good. It is cheap. You know, the modern modern day computers are very cheap. Uh, but however, if this is the solution for the future, I'm I'm not really sure. Right, so this is the advent of quantum computers, and we are here. And, and um, you know, um, I really congratulate the summer school uh, to take a lead in this area to educate the the, the next generation uh, the 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 possible uh, the, the promises of the future of this quantum computers. Now, um, you know, we saw this. There is this classical bit: it's the size of the transistor or the number of transistor, which is one zero binary. And uh, how a classical bit, like, you know, if you have like, uh, uh, how many classical bits, like, you know, two states, and the N is the number of transistors. So you have 10 transistors, you can have like 10 states, five transistor, you have 10 states, like 100 transistors, you have 200 states. But in terms of qubits, it actually goes as a power. So when you have, a, a, you know, N qubits, then it goes to power N. So you can pack large number of information using quantum states uh, rather than classical. Now uh, the qubit uh, equivalent of uh, the, 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 the bit um, uh, should represent three special properties, uh, which has to obey a quantum physics, or it has to be fundamental. So you take an electron, it's a fundamental, it's a quantum state. So you take an atom or an ion, it's a fundamental. So anything which goes, uh, you know, which can exhibit quantum properties uh, in a robust manner can be used as a qubit or where the quantum physics comes to play a part, like in the superconducting quantum interference devices and and, um, you know, where there's uh, quantum, quantum principles or quantum effects are manifested, those can be used reliably as a qubit. Um, but uh, there are three main special properties that to exhibit. One is called superposition, the ability to be in two states simultaneously. Um, another thing is called tunneling, a finite probability of a particle to be found outside its enclosure barrier. And there's entanglement where when you connect more qubits, they have to have a, a, a shared uh, state and uh, uh, behavior. Uh, well, now, I mean, I'm pretty sure like you, you have come across all these three, three things. And uh, for superposition, the famous example is uh, Schrodinger's cap. Uh, but let's, uh, let's move away from that. And I want to give another uh, example for superposition just to uh, tell you that why it is uh, encountered in our everyday life and why this could be you know natural um, now let's imagine a situation that um, you know you decided to go to your office and uh, you are getting ready for your uh, to see the cricket match of your favorite team well I mean as I told you I'm from Tamil Nadu I put Chennai Super Kings but basically you can put anything or uh, you want so the the the, the message is you have gone to your office, uh, you had, you know, washed the, the, your favorite t-shirt, put on the terrace, and um, the, the weather prediction is announcing, well, there's a 50% chance of rain. So you call up home and you tell your brother to, you know, I have my t-shirt there, like, can you actually uh, uh, take it to check whether it's dry and, and put it in the cupboard? 
now, uh, well, you can leave the office only at five o'clock. Let's say you're coming and on the way, you're just thinking that whether did this, this guy brother, did he do it? Uh, did, did it rain or did it get wet? So at that point, you do not know whether you can wear the t-shirt for tomorrow's match or not, whether if it's wet or not. So at that time, the only conclusion what you can make is, well, maybe it is wet, maybe it is dry. So you're confused. It's simultaneously, you'd be thinking, well, uh, it may be wet, it may be dry. Unless you come and open your cupboard and you see that the t-shirt is there, you would be relieved. So unless you make a measurement, you can only conclude it is proper ballistic. You know, simultaneously it's wet and it's simultaneously dry. This is what is called super superposition. So the ability for a quantum system to do to be in these two states simultaneously. Now going by the same example, let's take a mundane thing of tunneling. Well, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure, like you know, many students, uh, you know, here, um, the one thing is like you know, you, you you visit your home and you leave the key somewhere of your room or your bike, and you would know that pretty well. You you just left it there in, in an Almera. But when you go and search, it will not be there. And, you know, you ask your mom, like, where is it? And she'll say, yes, yes it should be there. Yes, I mean, it's, it's not there, you know, you see. But then it, somehow it would have moved, like, you know, somebody would have taken something. So there is a probability that it can be in another shelf or, like, you know, uh, even falling down, falling down and things like that. So uh, when, there is a, when there is a probability, yes, the, the key is there in the Almera, but not in the place where you, where you, where you kept and uh, this means there is a probability that even macro objects like this can move. But I mean, this is um, I'm, this is this is a purely a joke. But uh, however, I'm saying that finding a particle, uh, a quantum particle, out of its uh, um, um, out of its desired location is also probabilistically possible. This is tunneling. The next thing comes entanglement. Let's go by this mundane story. Well, you know, we kind of visit a, visit a wedding or, or something, or like, you know, a gathering, um, you know, just wave at, wave at your relatives, friends and everything. But you don't need to tell them something. You can tell the next person who's whom you are chatting, uh, you know, rumors spread very fast. And then this guy will talk to another guy and then that guy will immediately know. So this is how like, you know, this entire system is intact. So if two qubits are interacting, a qubit which is coupled to that one or even that farther than that can also carry information. So, you know, with, with, with these kind of mundane examples, um, but, uh, you know, the physics, the, 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 the pure physics uh, uh, definitions uh, should, be, uh, should be valid, however. All right, so, uh, so what are these quantum computers can be suitable for, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have conventional computers to do everything, so it should be okay, right? But as, as I quoted the Feynman, if we want to model any quantum system, it is better that quantum computer can do it better. For example, protein structure prediction, you know, multi-parameter modeling, some things like that. So if there is something which is probability-based calculations, you know, um, you know, maybe in a finance market, in, in, in insurance cases or so, wherever there is a probabilistic outcome, maybe in, including weather prediction, then the, the quantum computers would be able to do much faster. Um, multi-parameter optimization, when you have like, well, let's, let's, take, let's take a simple example that you uh, you want to go and buy something from a shop, and then um, by the time you get uh, get out of your house, you will make a calculation. Uh, okay, the the product is available in three locations, which is closer, which could be least expensive, which will not have traffic this time. Uh, will it rain? So you know there are the multi-parameters. So before you do one job, there are several parameters which can influence the outcome. So you have to optimize so that your job is done. So these kind of multi-parameter optimization a quantum computer can do much faster than a classical computer because the only way a normal computer will optimize this solution is, uh, you know, take uh, all these uh, optimization and run through various scenarios and try to find an optimal case. But a quantum system can actually see all the outcome at once. Um, so let's see a simple example. Let's uh, see a, a case of a mouse, right? A mouse in a maze. Uh, let's assume there is a mouse in a maze. The job of this mouse is to actually uh, find the exit. So what the mouse will do, it will just keep running. It will see a dead end. It will then reverse and it will see left, right. Like it will keep on going until it finds an end. 
But on the other hand, this is like a conventional computer set, right? So you have a, 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 a parameter which you want to optimize. You have like n number of parameter. You will take one parameter, run your algorithm through it, fix the value, go to the another one, and then run it through, or run the, that parameter uh, cycles and things like that. But how will a eagle do it? The eagle will just go up, take the picture of the whole maze, and then it knows where the exit is. So a quantum system will be like that. It, it can see all the parameter at once. Each qubit can represent one parameter space, and then you can put five parameters, a five qubit will be able to completely uh, optimize uh, this outcome. So um, uh, the, in this case, a mouse is a conventional computer, which does task serially, and a quantum computer will give an eagle side view of all the parameters simultaneously. All right, so, and then there is this case of unsorted data search. Um, well, the, the easiest thing is like, you know, if we take a telephone book and then um, uh, my, my name is Gopi. So uh, you have to look at the G like, okay, so where is, where is Gopi? And then you'll find my, my name. But if the telephone book is unsorted, the only way a conventional computer will find it out is to go through each and every data, uh, every name until it finds G which means it could be, you know, uh, the, the, the end of the book. But on the other hand, if there is a, if, if, if in a wall, the, all, the, all the telephone uh, numbers are printed with the names, then just having a one look at this wall, you would be able to point or pinpoint where the name is. So this is how a quantum would look at this problem, like, you know, all uh, of the simultaneously. The exact manner of the algorithm is a little bit more uh, difficult so explanation, but you know, I invite you to have a look at that very uh, interesting, innovative approach, how it's actually done in quantum. Oh, there are many more, and this is where I'm, I'm, I'm saying that there is a, a couple of papers uh, how all these quantum algorithms can be used for um, for, for for doing certain ta tasks. Um, I mean, there are several uh, fast quantum can kind of database search, and this is for scheduling, and there are so many things. Um, right. So this we already saw. So uh, let's see how we are doing this. Uh, this nitrogen vacancy defects in diamond as a as a qubit. As I said, uh, we def we we prepare these nitrogen vacancy defects, and this is uh, these are single NV centers, and we can use lasers and microwave to manipulate these uh, qubit states. Um, up, down, and superposition. Um, XCQ GmbH um, is, uh, is our company here based in Leipzig, Germany. And uh, we made a public demonstration on 6th of December. We presented our first uh, four plus qubit system. It's a room temperature operable quantum system, just like every, all the module is in this box. It's connected to the Wi Fi, and basically you can log in and do any quantum. Uh, algorithms which you can do with a four qubit device. So um, the, the goal of this one is we want to offer practical quantum processors to enable a head start for innovators to be ready for the global opportunities and challenges. Because as you know that, that there's a there's a quantum, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, interest in this quantum and uh, innovators already need, a, need to have some hardware. Yes, for some applications, the cloud-based access is okay. Uh, but um, for some secure applications, it is very essential that you need the hardware to be in your location, especially finance, defense, and cybersecurity. So uh, for that, um, if you want this to be affordable, then you know you can't have a lot of overhead costs like cryogenic cooling, vacuum, and things like that. But fortunately, this NV-based uh, quantum processors are solid state, which means that you, it's actually a diamond slab and it's very robust. And this is so compact as possible and very less energy, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's less energy consuming. I put it into the 220 volt uh, uh, socket in my home and then, you know, this is good to go. Um, so, so this box is actually mobile, um, you know, you can move around and it's so robust that it can, uh, it can be just uh, um, operational um, just by a turn of a key. So XCQ is making quantum process accessible and affordable for the next generation of technopreneurs. As a first step, we offer XQ1. This is a ready to buy four qubit quantum processor for early adopters. The key merits of our technology are room temperature operation, power efficient, sustainable, and, and mobile. 
um, when X executes unique selling point results in the innovation that scales up the quantum processors without compromising on the key advantage. It's not only we do not want to stay at four qubit, but we want to quickly ramp to several uh, tens and hundreds of qubits uh, in, the, in the next four years. So these are some salient features of ours compared to you know, IBM or Google, which is uh, currently uh, you know, uh, the, the commercially available uh, devices, uh, at least for IBM. Um, yeah, so ours is about 150 watts, which is several thousands uh, compared to uh, less compared to uh, um, the other competitors. So we talk about, uh, you know, right now we are four, four qubit and we will go to 256 uh, uh, in the next four years. And yes, it's produced in Germany and it's scalable um, with our proprietary technology. So, um, so yeah, so where we want to go, the mission statement is actually, um, I'm quoting um, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy here. Uh, we say that we wish to go to the moon because the challenge is the one we are willing to accept, the one we are unwilling to postpone, and the one we intend to win. Um, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, um, well, yeah, I have been working in this field uh, since my postdoc, my first postdoc in 2006. So uh, it's an excellent system, and vCenter is an excellent system. So the, 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 the end user, like the, the customers, the public should, should already start to reap the benefit from that. But there is a gap to take from a lab scale device to the customer ready device. So this is exactly what we are doing. And this is something which we are unwilling to postpone. So uh, I do not want to wait another 15 years to uh, this to happen. So we have taken the first step to bring this thing out of the lab and uh, put it in a in a box in a in a in a in a uh, in a normal place, and our quantum system is fully functional and operable. And this is the first step where the customer can can get the benefit, put their hands on, and start developing, and then take it to the next uh, uh, you know uh, innovation point. And um, yeah, so we chose this one because this is the one we are willing to accept to bring it to the commercial market and the one we are unwilling to postpone and the one we intend to win in terms of scalability and the affordability of our quantum processor. So um, yeah, our roadmap ensures XQ processors to the highest impact needs and the application. So this is our, our, our commercial roadmap. And um, um, yeah, so the XQ systems are mobile, green, sustainable, affordable, and secure. Some of the applications could be used for encryption, for safe transactions, secure communication. Um, it could be for multi-parameter optimization in finance, logistics, supply chains, and it can augment uh, AI and neural network for model training and probability-based computation. Um, so um, if, we, if we go by the, the market trend, I mean, this is, uh, this is from this article, uh, what I have quoted here, um, how, what kind of industries will benefit from what are the business impact and what are the problem domain where the quantum will be actually used. So as you see here from materials, manufacturing technology to, to, to quantum communication, there is a lot of uh, applications which are which are which are uh, you know, uh, being being thought about, and this will eventually happen. So it's important for the for the uh, you know the, the human resources to be ready to be trained in all these uh, the, you know upcoming areas uh, to uh, to be fit for the for the industry. Um, there's also, you know, as an industry, it's like there are several problems with algorithms. What will be most uh, impact, impactful, uh, for example, in life science simulation of, you know, certain small molecules binding pockets and, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, alternative, uh, uh, you know, uh, binding molecules and all these uh, simulations can be done. And uh, yeah, for logistics, yes, optimization and the least path search. And there are so many, uh, you know, industries and uh, uh, simulations based on AI and all those things. This is also taken from this, uh, um, this report. Um, now, yeah, so some, some, you know, kind of final remarks So quantum products, more like, you know, quantum technology products based on R&D have to move through a series of steps from a lab scale system to market compatible product. And um, the key should be unassisted use by a customer. Uh, should be the key metric before it can actually be, you know, sent out. So this is uh, you can't you can't sell a half baked good to a customer. It will immediately burn your uh, image. So this is why the key metric should be should be turnkey operable. And when you achieve that, and this is basically should be the starting point of uh, of, of taking it to a customer. 
Uh, the other key factors needed for such a process are technical expertise, uh, innovation mindset, user feedback, and financial resources to sustain this. Uh, any industry requires a vibrant ecosystem for hardware, software, use cases to grow and sustain. Um, on a computer has entered an industrialization stage now. Um, the market value is expected to surpass 700 billion by 2035. Um, I mean, I believe unlike silicon-based computer bits, uh, every qubit technology is unique. Um, example, superconducting, ion trust, photonic, solid-state qubit. So there will be, all these technologies will coexist in the next decade uh, because each of it has its own niche and, and use cases and, and flexibility. So they all will coexist at least in the next decade. Uh, there will be also some coherent emergence of hybrid uh, high-performance computer, quantum computing architectures, which will also come in the next decade and practically useful. Um, and also believe innovative algorithms and problem solving methods will rapidly emerge. And this is, in my opinion, the highest potential for, um, for the students and um, um, you know, uh, innovators, how uh, to adopt new ways of problem solving to new uh, uh, you know, problems which are present in the uh, society or for the benefit of, uh, of, of uh, humankind. Right, with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank you for further information. Please visit our website and you can send an email to info.xeq.com if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm ready to check. Yeah. Um, <coughs> hi. Hi. Yeah, my other one. Yeah. Yeah. This is Pawan. Uh, so I am doing masters in QU design. One one hour away from Leipzig. Yeah. Uh, my first question is that uh, how the uh, your company prepare the uh, four cubes. So how this uh, the, this will solve the real. Uh, what are applications problems? Uh, oh, so okay, so um, the four qubit system. What you what you see uh, is based on one uh, NV center and three nuclear spin qubits. Actually, minimum three nuclear spin qubits. So these are prepared by uh, 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 you know uh, enrichment of diamond, so that like we have one electron spin and three nuclear spin environment. So this is the four qubit system. Uh, so there. I mean, this is a four qubit system. The main idea behind this is, you know, this is a very affordable, you know, mobile system. You could take and then start practicing with, with algorithms, gates, and, and all those things, what you can do with a four qubit system. Um, yes, there are not much you can do with a four qubit system. At, at least like uh, this is a quantum system. You can, you know, you can, uh, you can use it like in, any other IBM uh, quantum or any other system. So uh, this is uh, fine. This is entirely up to the user. You know, we provide a, a quantum, a robust quantum, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a processor, and how they are going to use it is actually up to them. But we 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 are certainly help them with their needs and and everything they can discuss with our our team, and then we see that whether. Can be. But the whole idea is we want them to be prepared now with the four qubit because when our portfolio of products come, like you know, next year, next year, at least they will be prepared with the, uh, the methodologies. Okay. Yeah. My second question is that how the qubits are stabilized at the room temperature, whether it is reliable, reliable or not, because we are facing the noise intermediate uh, error correction. So at the room temperature, it will be have the higher uh, error. As uh, not, uh, uh, no, uh, no, no, uh, because the thing is, um, as I said, um, the quantum nature can exhibit in different uh, different conditions. Let's say for a superconducting quantum interference based system, yes, you need to cool it down to 4K or even lesser only then it will be in a superconducting state to exhibit a quantum. But a quantum is quantum. For example, a photon is quantum even at room temperature, right? 
And like this, this is an electron. An electron, when it is enclosed in a diamond lattice, a pure diamond lattice, it is intact and it is it is not uh, uh, deteriorating with uh, with room temperature or anything. It's, it's a, it is how a quantum system or how a quantum state is produced for 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 load. For example, ion traps doesn't require temperature at all. Actually, low temperature it, it needs vacuum. So each of this uh, quantum system has a condition where the quantumness can be exhibited. But for an NV-based solid-state qubit, uh, many of the uh, uh, criteria are relaxed. So NV center as such in room temperature in a lattice is perfectly quantum and it has a high fidelity enough. Uh, and with four qubits, you don't even need to care about error correction. The error correction really comes when you go to scale up the number of qubits. Yeah, and we have some uh, some protocols for doing that. Um, so, okay, this, yeah. Uh, so basically, this is Weinberg. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I uh, just wanted to know. So, what is the? So basically, you're talking about occupation numbers at uh, room temperature is very low, isn't it? Is, is, is that so? What are the coherence times uh, which coherence time which which the four qubit uh, commercial uh, device shows right so um, as i said um, oh, you know in this paper i see this in this paper ultra long spin coherence time of isotope clean genio diamond in right. 2009 i showed that the coherence time of this nv center is about 2 millisecond at room temperature and okay. for our four qubit device we have about 600 microsecond uh, coherence time. Um, so that's just the ballpark, right? But uh, we can, we also have, uh, um, you know, partners uh, who are uh, able to make these uh, two millisecond isotopically pure diamonds. So uh, it mm -hmm. depends on the user need. Yes, but the theory, the theoretical possibility is, yes, you could go to three millisecond, two millisecond at room temperature uh, is, uh, is, is well known in the literature. Right. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, can you make a speculation as to what quantum systems has the most potential for scalability in uh, 10 or 5 years? I mean, you know, uh, I would say all these quantum systems, uh, what, I, uh, what, I, what I mentioned, like, you know, uh, all the superconducting, uh, photonic ion traps, solid state, including ours, like, you know, we, uh, all, of this, uh, all of these companies have a route for scaling up, scaling up, you know, till thousands and ten thousands of those things. I mean, as you, as you recently saw, the IBM has a 3D kind of approach, which they uh, say that they want to go to 2000 qubits. And so, so every company has their own um, um, ways. And um, as a, um, yeah, as an, as an exper experimental uh, scientist, I, I do believe that, like, they are smart people. Um, they have a, a reliable way of, uh, of scaling up. And this is why I am I am very convinced that uh, you know all these uh, situations, all these systems will coexist at least for the next decade. There will not not be one system uh, which will rule all. Uh, basically, all the I mean, you know, this is fundamentally different from silicon bits, right? I mean, silicon, yeah, there's transistor flip flop. There is nothing much to do. But here, each of these things, I mean, for example, uh, you know, neutral atoms has extremely long coherence time. And uh, so superconducting, you know, has a, you know, you could, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, completely trans translate the, the, the chip fabrication technology. So each of these things has its own merits, actually. So and uh, smart people are working in all these uh, all these areas. So I do believe that all these systems will be in one way or the other uh, scalable. So there is no need for speculation. I mean, it's just ten years. We can actually. I I do believe in ten years, all these systems will coexist. Yeah. Uh, so so there is no preferred like a system which has a higher chance. Like according to you, like according to your experience. I mean, yes, well, you see, I have to be honest, right? You know, I'm an expert in my system, right? And I know uh, the, uh, you know, the, the materials, a lot of the scientific literature, what I'm reading from other systems. So I do believe, you know, we don't, we do not know the exact uh, uh, 
a scheme and approach as what everybody is following, but they are all very passionate and very talented individuals uh, in each of these, uh, uh, you know, team, talented team, not individuals. So I really believe that there is going to be not one because all these things will show scalability. And you know, finally, uh, yeah, I mean, it will be, um, yeah, this, this will be very nice, I would say, because each of this, uh, each of the system already, we are learning from each other very uh, efficiently. So uh, this is an exciting era, I would say. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. Welcome. Hi, please go ahead, uh, Dave Dutt Sharma. Yes, sir. Um, sir, are you using the NV uh, sensor for disease diagnosis? Disease diagnosis? I mean, uh, to, no. to sense the biomolecules, disease diagnosis, especially. Yeah, we are not using uh, in Exceed Q, um, but uh, there are several other companies they are using for small molecule disease diagnostics and, and all these kind of things, actually. Uh, yes, there are other companies uh, uh, using that, but, but we are concentrating mostly on quantum computation. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, can you can think that it will work uh, for diagnostic purposes. Means can this um, diagnose uh, um, the things means using NV center? Um, I mean, or... you know, uh, well, I mean, uh, I do see a lot of positive things with the NV centers, like for this this is diagnostics because um, this is like one atom sensor, which means that you can go very close, you can be much more sensitive. So uh, uh, I'm. I'm you know, rather than saying, well, you see, will not work is a wrong statement. It, it always requires an individual. When you make a statement, it will not work. That is the time an, yeah. ang an angster will come and say that he will prove you you're wrong, you know? So I would never make that it will not work. But I see a lot of positive points in, uh, in, in this technology. And I can, I'm also not going to say that it will work because there is, a, there is still a gap has to be solved. And several, uh, you know, um, intelligent teams are actually working on this to make this as a, as a viable uh, a commercial tool for yes, for, yes. for this diagnostics yes yes. yes 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 it will have a very wide scope uh, for diagnostic industry because it's working on the room temperature that's why i am asking this question yeah, absolutely you, you're right you're right I, i'm just saying that you know uh, uh, you know somebody has to really bridge the gap between what has been demonstrated in the lab to what can be bought uh, off the shelf, right? Or like a, like a company. So yes, uh, and efforts you, are you, being done and it will, it, it, it will, it will eventually come at, you know, I'm not an expert in that area to make a comment, but, but I, I share the same enthusiasm like you. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. thank you. Any questions? Um, I mean, like I said, uh, th this is the nature of the quantum uh, system here. This is this, uh, you know, defects, uh, electrons associated with defects in diamond. So the diamond offers them a perfect environment so that the electrons are trapped in the vacancy site and uh, they interact very less with the lattice so that they are inherently, you know, kind of isolated, which gives them the long coherence time. And the qubit state, uh, there is a gap so that the qubit, you know, doesn't automatically flip down or so. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is the uh, coherence uh, property, and these are you know just well reliable. Yes, so the 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 the, uh, the room temperature is still, uh, uh, you know, uh, does not make any uh, difference in the uh, in the you know function of the qubit actually here in our system. So yes, they are very reliable, even at room temperature. So any more? So 
Are there any further questions? Wonderful. All right. So, so thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, so um, there is um, the NV Center is is is. Um, um, you know, it's basically a host for the electron. So the electron is actually our, our operational qubit. So the NV center, the, you know, the electron is, is in the NV center. So this is in the host of diamond, right? And in the diamond, there are some other spins present na natively. And sometimes this electron spin can talk to that one from the, from the lattice and they could exchange information and that could flip. And this is basically one of the one of the source for an error and in that case there are some uh, quantum error correction protocols where instead of uh, using this electron spin um, every time we could actually store the information in a nearby nuclear spin which lives for a very long time uh, several orders of magnitude more than electron electron spin coherence time so is that you use that as a temporary uh, you know storage and then whenever you encounter error, you can check and then correct for it. And these uh, several papers, at least, uh, you know, four or five papers have been published experimentally on those things. So our task is uh, when we go to higher scaled qubit uh, processors, um, we would implement those schemes, which are also natively can fit into our quantum uh, bits um, and, uh, you know, offer the quantum processors uh, which are fully error correctable in case of need. So nuclear spin, uh, nuclear spin assisted error correction is a protocol what we would follow. I, I don't know what uh, what is uh, what is pure spin current, uh, but here everything is optically readable. So um, uh, I, I'm sorry. I think he has to refer some literature on that. I, I'm not an expert in that. Sorry. All right. Wonderful. Ah, all right. All right. Thank you very much. Then. Bye. Have a good day.